Hello and welcome to lecture 55 of my course From Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack and this lecture is on the topic of robust estimation. In previous lectures, in particular when we were talking about outliers and how to identify outliers and what to do with outliers, I mentioned the topic of robust estimation and robust regression as an alternative to identifying outliers in a more manual way. So in the next two lectures, we'll talk about uh, robustness. And in this first lecture, we're going to talk about estimation of just a few different parameters, uh, location and scale in particular. Next time, we'll talk about robust regression, and then we'll look at how to do some of these things in R. First, uh, what is robustness? Um, this, this is at the bottom here, you see this kind of standard textbook reference that everyone uh, refers to as, as one of the best references if you want more information on the topic. Uh, but robustness can be defined as the ability of your statistical procedure, your estimator, to handle a variety of distributions. We're very familiar with um, estimators that make the assumption of a normal distribution. And then we can derive all kinds of properties about those estimators. Are they biased or are they unbiased? How efficient are they, uh, et cetera? We love the blue, the best linear unbiased estimator um, when possible. But what if we don't have a normal distribution? What if we have a skewed distribution? What if we have a distribution with heavy tails? What if we have some outliers, uh, which we can consider as contamination of our data set with some data that came from a different distribution? Well, robustness is the ability to handle these kinds of uh, weirdnesses that can happen. Uh, and one of the ways that we measure robustness is something called the breakdown point. Suppose I have a data set and I replaced one of the data points with a um, weird value, an extreme value. Um, something that's, uh, you know, orders of magnitude off from the, the distribution that the rest of the data points exhibit. How many of these bad data points, these contaminated, contamination data points, can you tolerate and still get a reasonable result? We call this the breakdown point, and it will be a measure of how robust our estimator is. Many of the statistics we use are not robust at all. That is, even one bad data point can ruin that statistic. Uh, so we like robust estimators that have higher breakdown points, but there is a problem with robust estimators. They're less efficient. Recall that efficiency when it comes to estimators is uh, how big are the error bars? How big are the confidence intervals around my statistic. What is the standard error of that estimate? If the standard error is larger, say that estimator is less efficient. If the standard error is smaller, it's more efficient. We like efficient estimators, we like robust estimators, and there's a trade-off between the two. Let's take a look at some examples. But before I do that, let me mention something about contaminated data again. Uh, we, we often talk about robustness in the context of having a non-normal distribution. For example, if my data happened to follow a gamma distribution with a long tail, um, that's a non-normal distribution, but it's a parametric distribution that maybe that's exactly what our data is doing. Maybe it's an exponential distribution. Maybe it's a, a more like a, a student's T distribution with heavy tails. But we also seek robustness against contamination. Uh, this is the classic outlier style of, of problem where um, our data has been contaminated because some other mechanism has generated some data and stuck it into ours. Uh, we usually model this for the purposes of, of calculating the efficiency of an estimator or something like that in two ways. One is we assume that our Contamination distribution is has the same variance, but is shifted in the mean off by some amount. Alternately, you can assume our contamination has the same mean is shifted in variance. 
uh, in particular, a larger variance. So if we have the same mean but a larger variance, that means we're going to get more um, extreme values than we would have expected more frequently. That's a variance shift. Uh, we could do both at the same time, but there's really not much need. We, we generally model one of the two. Um, we might see this topic coming up again, but uh, the idea of contamination of uh, bad data points, so to speak, I don't, don't mean to be judgmental there. I mean, how it, data is not morally wrong. <laughs> so sometimes we like to uh, use less value-laden terms when we talk about data. All right, let's look at some location parameters. Location parameters or estimators are estimations of central tendency, our distribution. And the standard location statistic, of course, is the mean. This is what we most commonly use. And the mean, we, we know the formula for that, has a standard error that depends on the standard deviation of distribution. And uh, our estimate for the standard deviation, the true, true standard deviation is S. Of course, we all remember the formula for S, the standard deviation of our sample. And the standard error of the mean is S divided by the square root of N, where N is the number of data points in our sample. Now, this assumes a normal distribution. And so uh, what we're about to do is look at the efficiency of other location statistics for the case of a normal distribution. Uh, now, if I had a norm, non-normal distribution, Standard errors depend upon on that what that non-normal distribution is, but we can test any of our location uh, statistics with a normal distribution and compare efficiency, that is the standard error, uh, for that statistic, assuming a normal distribution, to the mean. And that will be the way we judge efficiency. So what are some robust alternatives to the mean? Well, the most common one is the median. We all know about the median, what it is, line up all the data in order, and look at the value of the middle point. The median has a breakdown point, or BP, of 0.5. In other words, up to 50% of the data, data can be contamination, and our median will still be reasonable. As soon as you go beyond 50%, then the median shifts to, the, to measuring the contamination. Uh, in fact, the maximum possible theoretical breakdown point you could ever get is 0.5 because once the contamination exceeds 50%, you, you can never tell which is uh, the right data and which is the contamination. Um, anyways, uh, breakdown point approaching 0.5 is the best you could possibly ever hope for. So the median is extremely robust, but it's less efficient. If I had a normal distribution, then the standard error of the median is 25% bigger than the standard error of the mean. So that's what we suffer. We suffer a 25% loss efficiency, uh, meaning the standard error is 25% bigger. There's also something called the trimmed mean. In the trimmed mean, we, we throw away some number of points. Here I show K off the top and the bottom. We often express the trim mean as a fraction. So a 10% trimmed mean, for example, would throw away 10% of the points off the top and 10% of points off the bottom. Let me stop here and mention that, that terminology is not standard. Right? There's two ways to express a 10% a trim mean. One would be 10% of the top and 10% of the bottom is thrown away. Or uh, some people will say a 10% trim mean uh, in that means that they throw away a total of 10% of the data points, 5% off the top and 5% off the bottom. Be careful whenever you see that terminology because different people use it in different ways. I know R and Excel, for example, use different definitions of, of the trim fraction. All right, I'm going to use 10% uh, trim mean to mean I, I throw away 10% off the top and 10% off the bottom, or throwing away a total of 20% of the data points. For that case, the standard error is less efficient by a fraction of the number of points you throw away. So if I throw away 10% off the top and the 10% off the bottom, this fraction is 0.2. So I'm 20% less efficient. The breakdown point is, is a fraction off of each end that I throw away. 
so the breakdown point would be 0.1 for a 10% uh, trimmed mean. First of all, we can compare these two and see that there's not much value in using a trimmed mean if I'm throwing away more than 25% of the data. So 12.5% off the top and 12.5% off the bottom, right? Because the breakdown point will be lower and the efficiency will be worse than the median. So you might as well use the median once you go above 12.5% uh, trimmed mean. The Windsorized mean. You might recall from when we looked at outliers that to Windsorize the data means don't just throw it out, but replace it with the maximum value closest to that data point that you're keeping. So in a Windsorized uh, mean, if I took a 10% off the top and 10% off the bottom, instead of throwing away, I would pile them up at maximum values that I had um, in, in the data that I didn't throw away. It, this version of the mean has about the same breakdown point and, and standard error. What about scale? The, the classic scale statistic is the standard deviation. Uh, we all know the formula for standard deviation. Hopefully we remember something about the formula for the standard error of the standard deviation. It's equal to the standard deviation divided by the square root of 2n n minus 1, but assuming n is fairly large, about the square root of 2 times n, for under the assumption of a normal distribution. Well, there are other robust, more robust statistics uh, for scale. Oh, by the way, what's the breakdown point for mean? What's the breakdown point for, go back, uh, for the mean and, and for the standard deviation? The breakdown point for the mean is one data point. So 1 over n, breakdown point fraction. Even one data point is enough to make the mean be useless. Same thing for the standard deviation. Its breakdown point is 1 over n. One bad data point is enough to make the standard deviation go bonkers. So we have some robust alternatives. Maybe one of the most popular, most useful, is the median absolute deviation. So we find the median of all the data, right? we get a number. Then for every data point, we subtract off that median. So that's the deviation from the median, and we take the absolute value. That's the absolute deviation. That gives me a, a set of n absolute deviations. Now I take the median of all of that in absolute deviation. Then I'm going to multiply by a constant. 1.4826. Where did that constant come from? Well, that's just a number that you multiply by. And some people leave this number out, but we will always use this, this constant, 1.4826. Because if I do that and I applied it to an infinite number of normally distributed uh, random numbers, I would get exactly the standard deviation. So this is simply a scale factor that allows the MAD absolute deviation compared directly to standard deviation, S. Um, because now they're, if I had a normal distribution, they'd give exactly the same number. Breakdown points 0.5, just like it is for the median, so it's very robust statistic. But the standard error is higher. How much higher? Well, it's 1.67 times the standard error I get I use the standard deviation, again, assuming a normal distribution. So 67% larger standard error, much less efficient. Um, that's, you know, that's unpleasant. And so many people have looked for other robust alternatives to the standard deviation that are more efficient. Uh, we're not going to really talk about any of them, but uh, in the next lecture, we will talk about M estimators. And... Uh, people have developed M estimators for both location and scale, which are a little bit more efficient than MAD. Uh, another one we've seen in the past is the interquartile range, the IQR. If I had a normal distribution, the interquartile range, uh, the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile, what's that range? Uh, it, the end of quartile range is 1.35 or so times the standard deviation for a normal distribution. 
but the interquartile range is very inefficient. Standard error is 2.23 times bigger than the standard error of the standard deviation. So, and the breakdown point's 0.25, right? So the breakdown point's not as high as MAD, the median absolute deviation, and efficiency is less. Now, you can guess that we're not going to use the interquartile range as our estimator uh, for range. Uh, MAD is going to be better. All right, let's take an example. In homework number two, I asked you to generate a QQ plot of uh, the measurements of the speed of light about 100 years ago by 125, 150 years ago, something in that range, 1880s, I believe, uh, by Simon Newcomb in the United States, uh, some of the early accurate measurements of the speed of light. And this data set had 66 measurements, two of which sort of looked like outliers, meaning the other 64 seemed to follow normal distribution. But two of them were way, way off. So this, you could say it's you know, a skewed distribution with a very heavy tail out in one direction. But more than likely, we can think of these two points as contamination or otherwise normal distribution. Well, let's look at our statistics for location and scale for this full data set. One of the ways in which you can detect non-normal distributions is by seeing significant differences in the different estimators uh, within the standard errors of those estimators. So mean of this data is 26.2, the median is 27, and the 10% trimmed mean is 27.1. So there's a there's a little bit of different the difference there. Um, how much? Well, no, only a little. Uh, what what we see, and we're going to see this over and over again, is some bad data affects the location um, measurements like mean. Certainly it does, but it affects the standard deviation even more because the standard deviation looks at differences squared, so it squares any um, problems, so to speak. So we see that here when we look at the sample standard deviation, it's 10.75. But if I, I look at a scaled IQR, and again, this scaling of the IQR makes the IQR value comparable to a standard deviation, I get half of that value. If I look at the mean, median absolute deviation, that is the MAD, uh, I get, again, something less than half the value of the sample standard deviation. The fact that these numbers are so very different from each other is an indication that the assumption of a normal distribution is not accurate. Well, let's take a look at these same measures if I were to throw out those two outliers. This is a will give us some understanding of what how robust these measures are. First of all, the mean changed by about 1.5. Right, the mean went from 26.2 to 27.7. The other two numbers changed only a little bit, and only about 0.5, so one third as much as the mean is. And now look at how much mean, the median, and the 10% trend mean match each other. Right, they're much much closer to each other than they were before. But that difference is small compared to the differences we see in our measures of scale. Sample standard deviation dropped in half by removing those two probable outliers. It went from 10.75 down to 5.1. Right, so it, it more than a factor of two uh, decrease. On the other hand, the IQR, but our, our more favorite robust scale measure, the ad, the median absolute deviation, stayed about the same. In fact, they changed about as much as our median and trimmed mean changed. Um, much Only about a 10% change in those values compared to a factor of two change in the standard deviation. Again, uh, we also see now that the three measures we have for scale are all giving about the same number compared to before when they were varying by a factor of two. This shows you how robust IQR and, and MAD are compared the sample standard deviation. All right, 
what have we learned in lecture 55? As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, please go back and review the material. Explain robustness and the breakdown point. What are some common robust location estimators? What are some common robust scale estimators? And finally, what is the main disadvantage of using robust estimators? Well, in our next lecture, we're going to extend the concept of robust estimation to include robust estimation of model parameters, in other words, robust progression. Till then.